Morgan Phillips, thank you so much for being here, man. And I am a fan of yours. I'm also sort of your pad one, <laughs> your pupil. <laughs> and and I'm really excited to have you here because I think this is going to be a really interesting episode, After, especially after having another one of your pupils, who was Matthew Greenstein. Um, I think it's very interesting to, that we get to see both perspectives because Matthew is somebody that's kind of looking forward to becoming a, a, a more... Um, proclaimed comedian and but you whereas i'm looking back and <laughs> regretting everything that i've ever done yeah that's it'll be fun to see both both sides <laughs> of the equation just for anybody that doesn't know who morgan phillips is can you give us just a little brief intro just who are you you know yeah uh and that's a, such a, a such a interesting question uh, four four months into the pandemic, as we record this, because right. I've actually been asking myself those <laughs> questions a lot over the last uh, several months. Uh, at the beginning, uh, before this started, all this all of this started. I would say that I am uh, uh, an improv comedian, and I teach uh, improv at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater in, in New York City at the, the training center here. Um, that was the main main way I occupied my time. I performed on a house team at UCB, the Upright Citizens Brigade uh, Theater, and and taught there as well. And since the pandemic happened, uh, the school shut down permanently, and the state of the theater is is in flux. So the main ways that I was defining myself don't apply anymore. So right. I'm a guy who's been doing improv uh, since I started in college in 1994. Uh, and it's the only thing that I haven't gotten bored with uh, mm. in my life. I've done other things for long periods of time, and then eventually kind of grew out of them. I was uh, I was in an a cappella rock band for ten years <laughs> after college, for instance, uh, and it, that feels like. I, I mean, I I I I'm, I guess I'm glad I did that, but also it feels like another lifetime. Uh, and I don't have any desire to be an acap in an acapella rock band anymore, whereas it did consume a lot of my life for, for literally 10 years. Uh, right. But yeah, I am, I'm, who I am right now is uh, a guy who loves improv and is trying to figure out what that will look like on the other side of the pandemic. Right. I mean, just to talk to on my end on status of things, I was taking classes with you and I was getting super super into it you know like every week i would look forward to these classes and they would be so much fun and i would be hanging out with people that first of all i didn't knew but they became a really close friend of mine just because we were in this together and then we all were looking forward to that one moment where we had that show and then the pandemic mm -hmm. happened and boom and it, <clears throat> and it just like kind of ruined that mood for for us but uh, I can't even imagine what it's, what it's like for you guys, for the performing arts. And the whole UCB as, a, as an entire institution, right? Is there any news about it? Yeah, it's all, it's all very much in flux. And one of, the, uh, one of the difficulties about knowing what it's going to be when it restarts is the other thing that has been going on in, in society as the pandemic is happening, which is... Right kind of in general institutions uh, being told, oh, no, you do have to deal with the systemic problems that you have. Mm -hmm. And UCB is definitely one of those institutions. Uh, and so as, as a whole, the institution is, is, is kind of finally facing up to some of the issues that have been talked about. And uh, there were attempts to help make things better in the past. But I think society as a whole is, is saying that's, that's not good enough. Right. Uh, we need to be better than that. So what UCB will be on the other side of all this is really unclear right now. Mm -hmm. uh, in a way, it's exciting because it's it could be a brand new start, or there could be something else that comes and takes the place of UCB if UCB doesn't get its act together. Uh, there is a theater, uh, an Upright Citizens Brigade theater in, uh, in LA, LA, as well as in New York, because the founders uh, who started it in New York eventually moved to LA and put most of their efforts into that theater. Uh, so the LA theater will almost certainly still be around on the other side of this. Uh, it's really unclear what the New York one will be, but 
one, I mean, all this gives so much, gives, gives everyone a chance to kind of get some perspective on stuff. So people who, uh, through privilege or just kind of intellectual laziness, uh, and I'll count myself among that, <laughs> thought of it as like, oh yeah, things that need to be fixed, uh, but maybe were lazy, I'll say, about uh, treating it as the most pressing issue. Right, not proactive. Uh, yeah, yeah, in a lot of ways. I mean, I, as a teacher, if you had asked me before uh, this kind of moment in history, was I doing things to help make things better? I think I would have said yes, but looking back, nowhere near enough. Uh, um, and it was all sort of like, oh yeah, I guess I'll do that as opposed to feeling a sense of urgency. What? Uh, okay, so I think we're ta you're talking specifically about uh, an issue that we haven't brought up or we haven't said it. Uh, do you, is there... I guess in a nutshell, mm -hmm. the UCB theater was founded by four straight white people. Uh, and uh, the thing with, uh, with institutions is that if they're founded by people of a particular description, uh, it, it tends to replicate itself. Mm. And there, it's not that UCB has been uh, entirely white, uh, but it uh, has looked a lot like that over the years. It's gotten... Mm quote unquote, gotten better uh, over the years. But I, I came to New York City uh, at the same time as the original uh, UCB in 1996. And so seeing it, how it was in the very beginning to how it is now, it looks like kind of amazing change, but also that was 24 years ago. So mm -hmm. amazing change over the course of 24 years is maybe not that amazing as far as change goes. Right, right. So because, of, because that was sort of baked into the system, there was a lot of inequality baked into the system as well. I see. And a lot of overlooking uh, uh, black students, uh, students of color, uh, and in the community itself, performers as well. So in, in trying to figure out what the theater will be on the other side of this, that's a big part of it, along see, with the I sort see. of existential right. issues. Right, uh, right, can right. you have a theater in a <laughs> you know, when pandemics are a possibility? So. Right. Uh, it's all a big mix and a big, uh, a big, uh, a big, a, a series of interconnected problems that need to be solved. Got you. I'd never do. I I didn't even think about it to be honest. When it when it when I with this entire you know movement of <clears throat> you know racial inequality, I wasn't even aware of the you know, challenges that UCB has to overcome as an institution. That's interesting to hear you talk about it because just being part of it, I ne don't necessarily think I felt that as a student, at least in your class, right? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously glad, glad to hear that um, within, because I, I feel like I did have some control within my class and I definitely made efforts to make it a welcoming space for everybody. But even just in these four months, looking back, there's lots of stuff I would do differently, mm -hmm. uh, or at least uh, prioritize differently. I see. Um, what do you What do you think in particular, like, kind of like opened your mind to being like, oh, maybe I should have done this differently? The specifically uh, on Facebook, mostly, and like you said, the atmosphere in class where you met these people and formed these quick friendships with them like that's that's true for almost everybody uh, on some level so there's a lot of good feelings people are sharing uh i think it's more a question of listening to these stories rather than, the, than they're finally being told right. but a lot of faculty students performers the, the whole community sharing stories of times when they were held back or made to feel uh less worthy mm -hmm. uh outright discriminated against. Um, mm -hmm. And some of it was people being really just horrible mm -hmm. people. Right. And some of it was unconscious. And then there's that sort of uh, middle ground where maybe they didn't realize what they were doing, but they should have realized what they were doing. Yeah. Um, so, it's, it, so, that, so it's seeing that online and reading a ton of those stories, it's an ongoing process of sort of figuring out how if i'm part of an institution like that again what are my responsibilities towards that got you no 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 i think it's it, i'm glad to hear you say these things and 
me getting a, a snip into your mind of how do you control these things as a teacher is is probably one of the very most challenging aspects of teaching improv. Um, <clears throat> do you find that the case? Yeah, um, making people feel people feel safe and uh, supported. Uh, just just as an imp a teacher of improv, those are things that need to exist for good improv to happen. I would say. Uh, right. or at least improv that won't be sort of emotionally destructive for the people doing it. Also to make the right. improv good, but, right. but just on a personal level, you don't want to do improv where the other people don't want to do it with you or feel comfortable doing it. So just sort of from a mercenary standpoint of wanting to have the best improv possible, right. you want people to feel safe and valued uh, and heard. Uh, and for me, it was, I guess that's part of it. For me, that was more of like, uh, I thought of it as, as another thing to pay attention to in class, as opposed to uh, a deeply important thing that affects every aspect of, of society and, and people's actual lives. But but that is a really important part of, I, I assumed all teaching, but improv comedy too, it just doesn't work. I think that, I think math, if you're a math teacher, you can probably have a pretty terrible class environment and some people will still learn math or be able to do math. <laughs> right. I mean, you don't want that obviously. And that has a whole, I mean, I just opened up a whole can of worms <laughs> as far as what that, what that would actually do if you had right. a classroom like that. And uh, you know, it's important that that not happen in math as well, but the actual doing of mathematics, the doing of an equation is not harmed by being a horrible human being. <laughs> uh, whereas right. improv is sort of just, it sort of destroyed. And I say that knowing that there are some really horrible people who've done improv <laughs> and done improv successfully and have been sort of heralded as amazing <laughs> improvisers. Right. Uh, so, so, okay. um, let's talk a little bit. Let's, let's step, take some steps back. Let's say there's somebody that's listening that's maybe interested in improv, but they don't really know what it is about. Right. They, they, they want to hear it from an improv comedian themselves. What is improv comedy? Improv comedy is uh, typically two or more people on a stage, typically, uh, doing what you would see in a comedic play or movie or TV show, but not having a script. So making it up together on the spot and building it together. Uh, the basic rule of improv is yes and. You accept what they, the other person or people put forward as true and you add to it. You say yes to it and you add something else and you build... Uh, you build the equivalent of comedy sketches or comedy plays, and um, that's what improv is. Yeah, I feel like <clears throat> from a from a non-expert, you know, from <laughs> a person who was a newbie, I feel like improv it was it's one of those things that you do unconsciously when you're having fun in in your life, right? One of the most obvious examples for me I can think of is when you're just bantering with your friends one of my closest friends Cody out of nowhere he would call my attention he'd be like hey Gabo and I'd be like what's up I was like fuck you dude <laughs> he was obviously joking it was just one of the ways that we would just have fun and I feel like that's what improv was at, at its core, right? At its yeah. at, at its core, at, everyone kind of does it in their life, but nobody really understands the art, which is where UCB comes into play, right? Can you, yeah. Can uh, you talk about a little bit about the art of improv? Well, uh, I've been around doing improv for a really long time, and part of that is I've seen a ton of really bad improv. Uh, anybody who's watched a significant amount of improv will see it. <laughs> usually see a lot of really bad improv. And I would define bad improv as improv where you're not quite sure why you're watching it. Mm. Uh, as an improviser, it's, it's actually really fun on some level to do bad improv uh, because it's like uh, it's playing a game with, like you said, it's a lot like hanging out with your friends and kind of riffing together and finding what feels fun and making more of that fun thing happen. But from an audience standpoint, some shows work and some don't. Some mm. are meandering and there's long stretches between the funny things and nobody's really sure what's funny about the funny thing. <laughs> so they can't make more of the funny thing happen. And then they will try to make more funny stuff happen and suddenly it'll fall flat. Uh, and before you know it, it's been 15 minutes and nobody has had any fun, including the performers. So, the, so improv 
uh, can be extremely not funny. And if you're going for comedy improv, which was which at right. UCB we are, there's also dramatic improv, which is kind of a different beast, a related beast, but a different one. Uh, if you're going for something funny, there are certain things you can do to have a higher percentage of fun of funny moments. Right, right. Uh, to notice to, to, the art, the art of it is noticing the funny things that are there and the things that maybe somebody else wouldn't notice. Uh, the the funny aspect of you, you hear something your scene partner says or your scene partner say, and you realize there's something funny about it, and you yes and that in a way that helps draw out what's funny about it. But the basis of the the artistic aspect of improv, at least the way that I teach it and 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 try to do it, is can you find the funniness? in something where somebody who hadn't studied the art of improv might not have even noticed the funniness. Yeah, you gotta almost train your mind to see these things and also let yourself carry, let yourself get carried away, right? Because Yeah. <laughs> because you can't it's it's not a it's not an art where you can stop and think and be like, oh this is what I'm gonna do. You know? It's very much an art that you have to be on your feet in the moment and you just say whatever it is that comes to mind, at least for my, in my experience, <clears throat> right? Definitely. Which is terrifying for a lot of people. <laughs> it is. So it... One of the things that I, one of my jobs as a teacher is to help it be less terrifying for people. And that's kind of where that sort of feeling safe uh, and feeling supported thing comes in. That's, that's a big part of that. People take improv classes for different reasons. Uh, some people are already want to be performers and it's just another part of their sort of mm. Repertoire of performing skills, and they want to hone that. Some people specifically know they they've seen improv comedy, and they want to do that. And some people are just looking for something fun to do, or trying to kind of loosen up as a person. Was it uh, was it at any point very terrifying for you? Do you have any, oh yeah. any anecdotes or experiences that? One of the reasons that I enjoy teaching improv is I've been terrified for most of the time, my time doing improv. So uh, <laughs> making it less terrifying for other people uh, really feels satisfying. I see. Uh, I me. see. For me, it started off part of it, it. That was part of the thrill of it. It's the sort of adrenaline rush of doing something scary. And then the show is over and you realize even if it was a terrible show, nothing bad has really happened. Like you're not, you don't die from doing a bad improv show right. and you can do another one and maybe that one will be good. Like, so the thrill of doing that, something that feels high stakes and then realizing afterwards, Oh, that wasn't high stakes at all. I'm exactly the same person <laughs> now, whether the show was good or bad. So that that's satisfying for me. What became the terrifying aspect of improv that I still, that I'm much better at, but still struggle with is specifically when there are people I'm performing with or who are watching the show, who I know are watching the show, who I look up to and admire, uh, mostly as improvisers. I guess if I admire them as a person, that's stressful too. But, <laughs> right, but uh, mm -hmm. being terrified that I will, I will be seen as not funny or not good at improv. I've had moments, uh, one of the improvisers who I uh, consider one of the highest, most, most skilled improvisers in the world, uh, her name is Becky Drysdale. Uh, I was in a show with her where I was so intimidated by her that one time I did, uh, I, I had my character uh, leave the stage and I kind of hid backstage because I didn't feel like I should be on the same stage mm. with her in that show because I was feeling so bad about my own abilities and I was so in awe of her abilities. Right. And then later on, I read an article she wrote or maybe an interview she gave where she talked about feeling the same thing with improvisers uh, that she admired. So for me, that was a bit of a, a wake up call of like, oh, everybody goes through that on some level. Mm. Even the person who, if I had to name an improviser, the most skilled improviser I can, she would maybe be the one I'd say definitely in the conversation. If you, I would say one of the things you one wants to try to do as an improv student and, and as you continue your, uh, your learning about improv as a performer, uh, is learn how to, <clears throat> excuse me, learn how to actually have fun. Right. That's hard. It's hard when you're worried about being, being funny or not being funny or whatever else you're worried about. I think one of the first things that I learned about and had the hardest time letting go was like, when it came time to do a scene for me, it was, oh, I have to be, I have to say something quirky or something like witty or something funny that's just like in itself funny you know and but 
how did you get how how did you discover improv to begin with like was there was there an experience in particular where you saw somebody made make improv or how was the discovery process for you uh i have no idea part of i'm 46 years old and so trying to get into my head as like an 18 year old <laughs> is kind of hard but i imagine it was something it was something like that so you were 18 um, years old when you decided oh i want to try this thing for the yeah, first time here, but but here's the thing uh i auditioned that year freshman year for my college group uh and i didn't get in Mm -hmm. Uh, and so at that point I said, oh, well, okay. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not funny enough to, to do it. Uh, I still love it, but, and so sophomore year came around, uh, and I considered auditioning again, because I had auditions once a year, I think. And I talked myself out of auditioning because I didn't want to be that guy who thinks they're good enough to do it, oh, but no. just keeps auditioning and doesn't get in. So I didn't audition sophomore year. And then junior year, I'd seen enough shows and I, I really wanted to do it. So I decided, okay, I'll try again. And I did get in uh, junior year. So that was 1994, I guess. So that's where I count the beginning of my, <laughs> my improv career. Uh, again, career is in uh, quotation marks because there's very little little money uh, involved <laughs> in the actual doing of him. And I will we will touch on that in a little bit. But so okay, so you get onto this team and you start performing for your college, basically, right? Right. Um, what happens after college? So like, the, are you are you thinking like, oh, I need to get a real job, or are you like? Yeah let's fucking go on this improv thing like a hundred percent let's let's just dive into it what was well, your mentality I mean? so here's here uh here's another uh, uh old man thing so <laughs> there was improv wasn't a thing yet uh i loved doing improv in college i love i did improv and acapella in college uh and <laughs> right. uh i was also a theater major uh, because i i i enjoyed performing and thinking about performing but i also got kind of jaded on the idea of theater as a thing. So I graduated and went home to California. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, so I went home for the first summer having absolutely no idea what I was going to do. And it was only because 10 of my best friends from college moved to New York that after that summer, I decided to move to New York. And there wasn't, there wasn't improv in New York. There was improv in New York, but in the sense that there, like, you could look in a uh, the T Time Out magazine was a magazine that people had listings for for theater events, mm -hmm. uh, and when that came out, I forget if it was every every week or every month, uh, you I would pour through it and say like, oh, there's an improv show this month, uh, and then I would <laughs> go to that improv show for sure, go to it. Um, so the idea of like, oh, I'm going to be an improviser was not really a thing when I started. Mm -hmm. And that's also when the UCB, uh, the UCB four, as, as they called them, the, the founding four members who moved to New York City to start something. Uh, I got involved with a short form improv group called Chicago City Limits uh, here, which is in New York, d despite mm -hmm. the name having Chicago in it uh, and took classes there. And uh, after three years of failed auditions there, uh, got into the the touring company for that group, uh, and so was doing improv around the country. But all, while all that was happening, UCB was getting bigger and bigger, and all of my most talented friends from Chicago City Limits, not all of them, but the vast majority of them, started doing stuff at Upright Citizens Brigade and having some success there. Right. So eventually I followed them to, to UCB. It's I mean, it's so long. Uh, I've been doing improv for so long. Uh, it's all kind of a blur now, but. Right. One of the things that I, when I was looking into your pro, well, obviously I do a little bit of research when, <laughs> before, before any, any guest comes over, but I think one of the most respectable things I found for you from you was the fact that you did a project called the a thousand scenes project, which right. I think is, <laughs> it's maniacal. <laughs> That's <laughs> accurate, yes. What is the purpose of this project? What was it what was the idea behind this thing? Like a lot of things, uh I think for I think this is true for everybody. I've definitely found it true for me. Uh in retrospect, there were good reasons to do it, but my <laughs> reasons for doing it were very dumb and not thought out at all. 2015 uh was when I did the 1000 scenes project. Uh and I, the year before, uh, 2014, 
I realized it was uh, my 20 year improv anniversary from when I auditioned uh, junior year and got into the, got into uh, okay, my college sure. improv group. So I was like, well, 20 years, that's, that, that's a long time. I want to do some sort of project to commemorate 20 years of improv. It feels like I need to celebrate it in some way. So I'll do some sort of project and maybe I'll start uh, January 1st, 2015 and do some sort of thing. And so I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Who would I collaborate with? And I started to see, I was sort of looking on, I guess on Facebook, like who do I, who have I met over the years that I want to do scenes with or do some sort of improv project mm -hmm. with or some sort of thing with. And I realized I know so oh, many <laughs> improvisers. I know, I know way more than a thousand improvisers. I probably know like three or 4,000 improvisers. And by no, I mean, have worked with at some point. Right. So I've met I've met literally thousands of improvisers. So I thought, oh well, you know, I'll set the bar low. Like I'll just do scenes with a thousand of, of the people that I've <laughs> met doing improv uh, over the course of a year. Uh, and I can't do it with them in person, but hey, here's this comparatively new thing, right. uh, video chatting. I was using Google Hangouts at the time. Uh, I'll do. 1,000 scenes, scenes with 1,000 different improvisers I know over Google Hangouts. And I'll give myself the whole year to do it. Uh, and I didn't really do the math. Uh, that's obviously, <laughs> when you think about 1,000 within a year, that's around three a day, a little less than three a day. And the, the logistics of it didn't really, I didn't really think it through that, you know, multiply the, the flakiness of one person time <laughs> and the difficulty of getting like scheduling a time to do something with people. Also, it didn't occur to me, some people don't want to do an improv scene online. So whereas I knew, I probably at the time knew at least 3000 improvisers let's say uh i had a re i had real trouble finding enough people to do it so what it ended up being was just sort of putting the word out there hey anybody who wants to do an improv scene with me online this year let's do it i'm trying to get to a thousand scenes so i did a lot of scenes with people i knew or had met once or had known for years and then a lot of scenes probably at least half of them if not more with people who i had never met before mm -hmm. uh often who i had no idea whether they'd ever done improv before um i did an improv scene with a child i did an improv scene <laughs> with a, a dog uh i did an improv scene with one of my high school math teachers, Matt, I had mentioned math earlier, so it all comes, <laughs> comes full circle, I, who just, anybody who reached out to me and said, I'd like to do a scene, we did a scene. Several times during the year, during 2015, I thought I wasn't going to make it, but thanks to other people putting out the word and kind of forcing their friends to do it, <laughs> I ended up doing more than a thousand online improvised scenes in a year. But there was there was no thought to it, to put into it, other than I want to do something big to celebrate 20 years of improv. Mm. In retrospect, it probably did make me a better improviser doing so many scenes but also being able to watch them afterwards and see there's lots of them that are just not very good <laughs> and the vast majority of those i would say that's it was probably my fault uh, <laughs> some of them were not my fault sometimes there, I, I did a few scenes i won't call anybody out but there were a few scenes where it was, the people were it turned out to be monsters uh <laughs> And it's just fun watching them now because it's like, oh, seeing myself have to right. deal with That's that. why I'm but, laughing. <laughs> yeah. It's, My, fun, most, it's most funny the, now, I bet. But it was horrible. Oh, no, it, was the... funny. it was funny at the time. But it was also just sort of an overwhelming thing because I had to basically think about it every day for a year. Right. Did you ever thought at any point were you thinking like, ah, fuck it. <laughs> what, am I, what am I doing this? Why am I doing this to myself? I did think, why am I doing this to myself? But I never thought, fuck it. Like, I don't think mm. I ever considered giving it up. I did consider the possibility that I wouldn't uh, <laughs> achieve what I was trying I to see, do. I absolutely. See. And it, in fact, at certain points, it felt like absolutely impossible that it would happen. Uh, it's, it was not worth it. It was definitely <laughs> not worth it on any sort of like uh, real level. What, uh, what do you mean? Like, do you think you didn't get enough uh, like growth out of it? Or what? Maybe not as as much as you would expect it. Why do you think it was not, it was not worth it? I think just looking at it as as uh, sort of how much time I put into it versus mm. what I got out of it. Mm. Uh, I, I maybe I guess this is sort of a recurring theme for me is could I have spent that time on something more useful? 
Mm. So it's not so much regretting the doing of it because I, I like the idea of just doing dumb projects for the sake of doing them. And uh, I'm very stubborn. So I'd like to stick, stick, you know, stick with it until it's done if possible. What if I'd spent literally an entire year working on some other way of bettering myself or getting better at uh, another skill? Right. Uh, I was still doing regular improv in the, in the, in the world. I don't know. I mean, my two cents would be that even if the return of in, in, of investment wasn't as much as you uh, you would have hoped for, I think that just going in through retrospect, that yeah. right in retrospect, just going through that process must have been like a learning experience of like doing something that's hard, doing something that you might not be able to achieve, but you're just like trying really really hard to do it, and just like being in that state of of like. You know, sometimes in life we get in this mode of, oh, I just got to work. I just got to work. And, and, and we, we, we have a vision that's like this, that's very narrow. You know, you, we only see the end. And people are like telling us like, oh, you should do this. You should do it. You're like, get out of here. You know, like I, I, this, is, this is my thing right now, right? And then at the end of it, you come out and you're like, oh, shit, I did something. Like, obviously, there's mistakes. There's, there's all these lessons that you learn from it. But... Just going through that harsh time and, and just like working really hard to get something that you want. I think that's just like the core of, of like how you win at the game of life, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. It's worth it to put your head down and really try for something that maybe doesn't feel like, maybe it's not, doesn't, you're not sure it's a good idea, but you're just going to see it through. But you do have a, you do have a limited amount of years of your life to dedicate to something. And you know the, and I have to I have to say it's so much easier to do those bad ideas if you come from a place of privilege where it's easier for you to do those things. Right, right. Uh, just like because this is a very, I want to mention this because it's a very real aspect of trying to achieve your dreams in New York. Mm -hmm. I I don't come. I, I mentioned that I'm white. Uh, I don't come from a rich background. My parents are, are not wealthy, but my parents have been incredibly supportive of me, both emotionally and financially. Uh, they, beyond their means, have done things that have allowed me to continue pursuing silly things like, I mean, you know, comparatively silly things like <laughs> professional acapella and uh, being an improv teacher and performer. It's easy to say on one level. It's easy to say, yeah, pursue your dreams. It doesn't matter if you fail. Right. But it's a really, it's really a balance. You got. I mean, I I am incredibly grateful for the ability to do that. I'm I'm wary about saying like, yeah, just fuck it, pursue your dreams. Mm. Uh, of course, I see what you're getting a, at. It was it was easier for me to do that. Yeah, I mean, for the way that I think about it is from a psychological standpoint. You know, there are certain things, there are basic needs that need to get, co need to be covered before you can even think about, you know, becoming a realized human being, right? Which is what I think the end, the end game for everybody is, you know, they want to, they want to feel like they're accomplished something in their life. They want to feel that they're doing something important with their lives and they want to feel that they, that they have influenced people positively in their lives, right? But if you, None of that comes into play at all if you don't have a roof, food, and people that care about you, you know? Like, right. and, 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 and if those things aren't, are, are, aren't at play, these conversations that we're having are basically, what do you call it, irrelevant, right? Yeah, or at least just totally different. Again, to bring it back around, that's it, there's definitely personal responsibility that comes along with that. And what can we mm. do as individuals? What can I do as an individual to make that make that less of a thing? But that's that's a big part of the inst the problem of being an institution mm. like used to be. And one of the things that it has traditionally fallen short on is making it a sort of level playing field. Uh, to be on a team, a house team at UCB, which is what 
a lot of the students aspire to. If they want to do improv long term, one of the things they they want to be able to audition for a house team and eventually get on a team. To be on a house team, first of all, you're not paid anything to perform at the theater the, the way that it has been. And you actually have to pay to be on a team. You're required to hire uh, an improv coach to, to meet with your team once a week. Uh, and the UCB would try to pro provide a rehearsal space for the teams, but because of scheduling stuff, you often would have to rent a room elsewhere. So you have to pay money to be on the team. So this goal that everybody had, it, was, it, it meant different things depending on your ability to pay for it. And same thing with taking classes. I mean, one of the things I was able to do over the years, now granted I have an extreme amount of credit card debt and as I say, parents who've been very supportive over the years, but I took 21 UCB improv classes. I act. I haven't mentioned this, but uh, following my pattern of uh, auditioning and not uh, getting onto teams like in college and at the the short form mm -hmm. improv place, I literally set the record for number of unsuccessful auditions at UCB before getting on a team. Uh, I auditioned uh, eleven times unsuccessfully before actually finally getting on a team. And people hear that and they're often like, "Wow, that's amazing! You stuck with it," or like, "Wow, that's amazing! You <laughs> stuck with it." The I guess the missing part of the of the conversation, or at least missing for me in the way I've been thinking of it in the past, is well, that's on one level impressive, maybe, but also I wouldn't have been able to do that if I was if I was more worried about ha paying rent. Right. Uh, I've been very worried about paying rent, uh, but I've always had the knowledge that worst case scenario, I, I, I'm not going to be out on the streets, you know, beyond paying or not paying, asking people to do things for free. And that's another thing I'll call myself out for. I was great. I was always grateful to be part of, of UCB and on a team and everything. And I never felt the need to be paid for performing there. So when I heard other people in the past talking about we need to pay performers, I understood it intellectually. But for me, it felt like that's such not a pressing issue. Like we do it because we love it. What's the, like, why, why would we need to be paid to do something we love? But it was, that was really uh, kind of lazy thinking on my part. Mm. Uh, because my, my experience of being able to do it is not, a, is not a universal thing. You're not really getting paid to perform. I am, I am guessing that the way that most people go, that if they want to stay in the same profession, is they either open up their own theaters or they start teaching and coaching improv. So, yeah. like, is that how you got into it? Yeah, actually, I started teaching at the short form improv theater, uh, Chicago City Limits, that I was at. Once I was on house teams there, uh, it was a much smaller theater, so there were there were not that many performers there. The, the main stage cast I was in was four people, I guess. Mm -hmm. So there, like, I was sort of almost default one of the teachers there, <laughs> uh, and I I liked the idea of it, but I didn't know that I loved it yet. And then once I sort of worked my way up through the UCB system, it felt like a fun idea to start coaching groups. I did it out of, out of a sense of oh, this feels like fun. Mm -hmm. The money aspect of it is is obviously great uh but i was always working at the same time almost always working at the same time until a few years ago was was office temping and and doing other not non-improv jobs like that mm -hmm. at the same time so any money i was making was on top of it the last few years i've been teaching i guess i've been teaching at ucb pre-pandemic for for three or four years i was teaching up to six classes a week and wow. the teachers typically get paid around a hundred fifty dollars a class session so i mean you can do the math that works out to about about nine hundred dollars a week which for new york city is not okay. not a great salary but for me it was the most most money i've earned uh in a year so it felt very good to be making a living that way but there's there are some opportunities to be paid for performing improv but most of the money people make from improv is from is from teaching if they do that or from the opportunities that being affiliated with the improv theater and the people you meet, the, the opportunities it provides you to do paid work like commercials or, or writing or that sort of thing. I'm just trying to understand, how does somebody go from, you know, performing at, at, a, at a house team to being uh -huh. like a superstar of improv, like being at SNL? Like, it, do you... 
Is that something that you at some point were like, oh, I want to do that? Or was was that like so far apart that you thought it's maybe like something different than you want? Or is it not aligned with what you want? Do you like SNL? Mm -hmm. Saturday Night Live is definitely sort of a touchstone, or at least it has been in the past. I don't know whether it's still uh, like if you ask a comedian what their ultimate goal is or an improv comedian, I think a, lo a lot of them traditionally have, have said Saturday Night Live. I, I would have loved to have been on Saturday Night Live. But the funny thing about SNL uh, is I've now known people who have gotten on SNL. Mm -hmm. And some of them have been very successful. Uh, but even the ones who are very successful on SNL, for, I, I used to think getting on Saturday Night Live means, <laughs> oh, you're set right. for life. I also uh, was, I'm thinking of one guy in particular, I was on an improv team, and he is an incredibly funny guy. And he got on Saturday Night Live. And he was one of those, not a full flat, it's a featured cast member, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was that. And then I guess he didn't, he didn't get asked back the next year. So he made it. He got everybody's dream. He still has the level of talent that got him there. Seeing that was sort of eye-opening mm. for me of like, oh, you, there's no, in a, in, a, in a performing career, there's no, there's no real end point. Right. Like you, you want to get so established that it becomes easier to get opportunities. But even I think at the highest level, anything but the very highest levels of, of being a performer, yeah. uh, you're constantly having to hustle and work for it. Um, but not, you know, it, that's great if you set out and I found out that I love teaching improv. Mm -hmm. So it was a dream job for me, which didn't really have much to do with my thought of like an improv career. It's just like, oh, I, oh, while I'm doing this improv thing that I'm doing because I love it, uh, I found this thing where I get to talk. I mean, obviously any, any listeners to this podcast, you'll be shocked to hear. I love talking <laughs> about this stuff that I'm passionate about. Uh, so I hope that came across uh, in the class. Like I genuinely love improv and oh. love sharing it with people and like seeing them figure out that maybe they like improv too. That's a really satisfying thing on a human level to say, I feel passionate about this thing. And then see other people feel like realize, oh, hey, I might be passionate about this too. That's like, you can't beat that. Well, you mentioned just a little bit about your class and I just wanted to say that I definitely felt the emo the passion <laughs> by both you and the supporting the, the supporting teacher who was a uh, kk who yeah i uh, had a sort of stu student teacher who's my my good friend and improv teammate uh kk who uh who taught some a couple of the classes and uh and sat in for the rest in her uh apprenticeship to become a full-fledged teacher i wanted to ask you um what do you think because i think what do you think of our class? Not not as in like uh, anybody names or anything. I was just wondering in terms of the curriculum and how it got cut off because in in my mind it feels like we were missing that one essential you know the show, the one that one essential yeah. lesson. Like w what is that for you? I, what what was I, yeah. the importance of the show? Let's can can you tell me a little bit about that? Because very I, important and you got screwed as a class but so the, the the way that the classes at ucb and a lot of other improv schools work is you do however many weeks of class and then you you're, you have a culminating performance where you have a, a show in front of uh, invited people and, and people off the street hypothetically <laughs> who uh, see you actually do improv on stage instead of just sort of learning how to do it in class yeah. and that's a huge part of it because it does change how people improvise, it changes the feel of doing it. It also feels different to take a class after you've experienced doing it on stage because sometimes it just kind of clicks. It's like right. it's one thing in a classroom environment, it's another thing actually on your feet and doing it. And sometimes it's much easier than it seemed in class when you have an audience full of people laughing at things. Right. And sometimes in some ways it can be much harder. Uh, if you're somebody like me who has issues as far as wanting other people to uh, like you and approve of you, which I think <laughs> describes a, a lot of a lot of people. The added pressure of having an audience out there that hypothetically might not like what you're doing is a really emotionally fraught thing <laughs> to, to go through. Right. But again, the surviving of that, because the one on one class show tends to just be really fun and kind of a love fest and a celebration of what happened in the class. So it's a it's a great hypothetically a great uh, potentially first improv experience. Not everybody who takes one-on-one is, is, is 
doing improv for the first time. You definitely have more experienced right, people right. Uh, doing it, but it's usually a mixture of more experienced people and people who maybe have never done it before. The one cool thing is that once, if there are, if live theater becomes a thing again, uh, we can do a class show, whether UCB officially does one or not. Right. I mean, I would, I would love to do what I can to help get everybody from that class together and just put on a show <laughs> together and we can run it exactly the way we do a class show. It might not feel the same because right. it's not on stage at UCB, which also, by the way, doesn't exist anymore. The theater is also not going to be, uh, they right. gave up the theater as well as the training center. So I guess it's all, 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 everything is up in the air for, um, for UCB and, and anybody that, um, is trying to do comedy because it's not only the people that are doing improv comedy, but also stand up comedians are having a hard time. Have you, what is your thinking about this? Are you just hoping that everything will kind of like, that will kind of like fix, fix itself at the end? Or do you have any more like proactive plans that maybe somebody could get an idea from? Or I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> it's so hard, right? It is It is hard. There's so many factors that go into it. Uh, and just with the pandemic, there's all these, I mean, having to figure out like what is a, what is a risk worth taking? Uh, that's, I don't envy anybody making that decision. I don't, I don't think there should be live theater anytime soon. I don't think there will be. I know that the, I guess Broadway announced recently that they're not going to reopen at least through the end of, of this calendar year. And that one of the scariest things about uh, a pandemic is this is this pandemic. This is this wave of this pandemic. Uh, beyond other waves of this one, there might be another one next year. Right. Uh, so what do you do going forward? I, and I have no idea what the answer to that is. Uh, we mentioned doing improv over Zoom, which is what a lot of people ha have been doing. But I will say that a lot of a lot more Zoom improv was happening at the beginning of the pandemic than has been happening recently. And some of that is because, uh, I mean, people are out protesting or uh, trying to figure out, you know, uh, other more pressing things about their life or their life in society. But some of it is also people doing improv over Zoom is not great. There's ways you can make it better. Uh, right. And I've been doing some, not recently, but I, uh, especially at the start of the pandemic, was doing a fair amount of coaching over Zoom. There's definitely ways you can make it better than it could be, but it really reinforces some of the bad, the things that make improv bad are reinforced by doing it over Zoom. Mm. Uh, so like a virtual solution, a good one I don't think has as, as, uh, come forward yet. I don't know what I'm going to do for a job on the other side of this. Uh, which on a personal level is, is, is scary. But I also know that all the times I've been scared in the past uh, about choices I've made or what's going on in my life, they've turned out to be temporary things. Mm -hmm. So I think that this huge problem that, that uh, perform, the performing arts are facing right now is a huge problem. But I, I think maybe, maybe we'll figure something out. Uh, it's not going anywhere. Performing is not going anywhere. Right. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see. I have no idea, though, is, yeah. is my answer to that. As we, as, we, as we spoke before, improv is kind of intertwined in all aspects of our life, right? What do you think was one of the biggest uh, pros, you know, one of the biggest uh, benefits that you encountered in your life for being an improv comedian? Hands down, the people that I've met doing improv. I, I mean, I definitely have some friends that I didn't meet doing improv. I have some friends I've known since college and some, some sort of random people I've met along the way. But the vast majority of people uh, I consider friends. Uh, oh, I hope this is not a bad sign. I can, there's thunder in the background here as I'm talking oh. about this. I hope it's not <laughs> disapproval from the universe. That I, I've met the most amazing people. I've been in New York City for 24 years surrounded by insanely talented people. Half of my great best friends probably don't know they're my best friends. I don't <laughs> do anything to, to show it. Uh, I love so many people that I've met and I'm so in awe of them. And that's something that no matter how you get to do that, even if you're not quote unquote successful at improv. Right. Uh, so if that, I think that's a worthwhile goal. Again, it's a goal that is easier to, to benefit from and pursue when you're not worried 
about where your next meal is coming from or where your next rent right. check is coming from. Uh, but that, as far as tangible benefits, uh, I think it's helped uh, help me be a little bit more courageous, although fear is something that I struggle with all the time and all mm -hmm. sorts of aspects of my life. Uh, hopefully not taking myself as seriously, hopefully listening to other people more, although, you know, that's, it's, I think it's true for all improvisers of every level that if you, if there's one thing to work on, it's talking less and listening more. Exactly. I would hate to say, I mean, on, on one level, I guess I won't feel that bad about it because you are interviewing me on this podcast, but like, I think it'd be pretty embarrassing to see like if they showed a ratio of like how much you were talking, how much I was talking, it would be insane. I, it would be just, uh, and I, you know, I, I hope if you go over improv scenes I've done, uh, it's not mostly me talking, but I suspect that, that a lot of them would be. So I've gotten better at that. I still have a ways to go, but, but listening to people, you brought this, this point up, this idea of it being a lot like life or, uh, the thing, the thing that you were getting out of it, like listening to people and getting inspired by them. Uh, that's a big part of this. If, if this is a game, uh, a big part of the way you earn points, I think is by, noticing things in in the world around you that you maybe wouldn't have noticed if you're not paying attention after you've gone through your life as an improviser and and if you, you've done like obviously you've done the south a thousand scenes project you've done several different performances in ucb what did you think what do you think is the thing that really really makes you happy at the end of the day there's definitely a sense of accomplishment from the personal growth I've had. It feels good to get better at something. Mm -hmm. uh, even the Thousand Scenes project, I look back at it now, and it's I don't I don't grimace watching myself anymore because because I've seen myself so much. Uh, but I definitely recognize that I'm a better improviser now than I was five years ago. So you can only imagine I started improv 24 years ago. The, the thing that makes me feel happy about what I've done in improv is I've got gotten to meet and interact with and collaborate with all these amazing people. Uh, whether or not they give me jobs in the future, which is also absolutely an aspect of the improv community and the comedy future, that sort of networking aspect of it, mm -hmm. uh, any, any paying opportunity I've gotten as an improviser is from the people I've met along the way. There's this picture, this famous black and white picture of they assemble all the great like jazz musicians of a particular era together. And I forget, I forget what they call this picture, but it's this like famous photograph of like, they got all these jazz musicians together and oh my God, that person's there and that person's there and that person's there. And I don't, I wasn't in any photographs like that, but I've been in lots of situations where if you were able to see who all those people, who I was around, uh, it was a sort of renaissance. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been a renaissance of comedy, going from where it was when I started in 1996 to like you look in a in a monthly publication to see if there is an improv show this month, to not at least before the pandemic, nonstop improv at multiple right. venues every night of the week. Just being part of that has been a really right. like it look a uh, sort of thing where you yeah. look back on your life and say, "I'm glad I got to be part of that." I yeah. definitely feel that's that. awesome. That's awesome. That's that's like being part of the Lord of the Rings, <laughs> being part of the of the of the of the hobbits that you know I got Much everything lower I could. Stakes, I would say. <laughs> Although at times it has felt as high stakes <laughs> as uh, Lord of the Rings. Uh, that's the other. That's the sort of absurd aspect of all this. I guess everything in life, almost everything in life, is absurd if you look at it closely enough. But mm. the things that I have spent my time doing. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of acapella and improv are uh, extremely absurd when you look at them close up. Throughout your entire life, you basically just try to do the thing that you love the most. Am I, am I correct in saying that? Yeah. And also, and the flip side of that is I have been allowed to do that right. as well because of yes. my circumstances. Yes, but uh, I think there's also credit to you because... Someone told me the other day, it's like, Gabo, I'm so, I'm, when I see you doing, you know, the podcast and like you following, doing these things that you want to do, I, you know, you, it, it, it gives me a lot of inspiration and I'm, and right. 
And to me, yeah. that sounds very foreign. You know, it's like I'm just doing, you know, I'm just doing this, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but and but I also kind of had to reconsider what they said, right? Me doing the things that I want to do, right? And it's like, what else is there in, <laughs> in <Yeah>. this life? <laughs> Like if I'm if I'm not doing the things that I want to do, what the fuck am I doing? You know, in my, with my life. So with that said, like I feel that you have always just like done this thing, and like ma even even when it didn't exist, which is so impressive, and I think it's so awesome. And ended up <clears throat> for twenty one or how many however many years, ended up practicing this art that is it, to me amazing and incredibly funny so i respect you a lot for that and I, thank you for coming and telling your story here morgan oh my pleasure thanks um let's wrap this up and uh is there any if somebody listens to this <laughs> and wants to contact you what would be the best way to like look you up or is there any plugs that you want to like throw in here so people can find you morganphillips.com is my website and i am at morgan on twitter so those are probably the best ways to to get a hold of me morganphillips.com and at morgan at twitter that's amazing on that twitter. you got that morgan twitter. that's uh <laughs> that's a story of who you're around when and the, probably a story of privilege as well in that i went <laughs> to college with and was in an acapella group with a, one of the guys who uh, was the original employee of Twitter, so he oh. bugged me to to get a uh, a Twitter handle. So oh, like immediately, right as it came yeah. out. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. That's crazy. All right. Anyways, Morgan, thank you so much for being here, and I really, really enjoyed this. I think I think it's one of the most enjoyable conversations I've had so far. And personally, Glad. because you know, I'm I'm a I felt like, kind of fell in love with improv when you were teaching me, and I really appreciated you for it. And I'm that means a lot. Thanks. And I'm super happy to have you here. I was super happy to have you here. Thank you so much. I look forward to the class show that we will have <laughs> someday soon. Someday. <laughs> <laughs>